What we have here is a very special 1969 Mercury Cougar. This Cougar is an XR7 convertible with the GT package. This car is an amazing barn find and it's serial number 16, so 00016. We found this car in Gilbert Plains, Manitoba in 2015 after being put away in a shed in 1984. After doing some work on the car and getting it roadworthy, we were able to put 50 miles on the car in 2017. This is the first time the car had been on the road in over 33 years. I'll get into some of the repairs, what the car needed, as well as what we discovered at that time uh, while working on the car. But first I'm going to talk about the car itself and the history behind it. This is a very rare, well documented numbers matching car. The car was built from the factory as an introductory show unit. Under the build date is the code 04G, which stands for July 4th, and well, obviously they didn't build cars on Independence Day. That's why Ford and Mercury use this as a code for the first group of cars to be built on a given production year. Some people refer to these cars as pre-production or stall-built cars rather than first day production cars. According to the expert who th authenticate these cars, these introductory cars did not go down an assembly line the way production vehicles were built. Ford had engineering spaces where they'd set up and test fixtures, jigs, and so on that would be used. Those sub-assemblies, including the chassis bucker, are wheeled into an assembly area where they are checked to see if they fit. None of the parts are being mass-produced at this point. This is where the extra leading of the seams and other show prep occurred. So the production date on the Marty report is 43 days after the 04G date, although these cars were actually built well before this date. Ford had to wait until production officially began to count the vehicles in their production line. Also, these cars were not necessarily built in the order 1, 2, 3 either. This car 16 could have been the first or second car built, or it could have been the 20th car built, even though it's serial number 16. Either way, it's one of the Cougars that was built in the first group of cars that year. The first day of production for the 1969 Cougar in Dearborn, Michigan was August 16, 1968. The date codes on this Cougar are mostly July of 1968 and there even are a few interior items that have a June 68 date code. It was an all new redesigned body style for 1969 as well as the first year convertible. So everything was restyled for this year. So besides this car being a rare introductory car, it's also rare by the production numbers. There were only 347 XR7 convertibles built with the GT package for 1969 and only eight built like this one. You can look at production numbers many different ways. For example, 412 XR7 convertibles were metallic green, only 245 had white leather interior, uh, 1,076 came with their same engine and transmission as this car, etc. But for this particular Cougar, the numbers break down like this. There were 4,024 XR7 convertibles built and only 347 of them had the GT package. Of those, only 26 were built in number 4 metallic green with white leather interior and a white top. Add in the other options and we're down to 8. And I'll go into these options in a bit. I should also note that the 1 of 8 number does not take into account that it's an introductory car or that it was shipped out of the country. If those facts were added, the number would be even lower. So this is a rare, really unique car due to its low production numbers and the fact that it was built as a pre-production introductory show car serial number 16. Because these introductory cars are going to be on display, special attention was given to these cars regarding the detail and quality of the fit and finish. Some of these factory built show cars were highly optioned to showcase the options that were available to the customer for the 69 model year. This particular car was shipped to Midwest Canada DSO A4. So this 1969 Cougar XR7 convertible was the actual stage reveal car for the Canadian Prairies. This car was unveiled in Winnipeg, Manitoba in the beginning of October 1968. So this car left Dearborn, Michigan, September 3rd, 68, and went to Oakville, Ontario to the Ford Motor Company of Canada, and then on to Winnipeg for its stage reveal, and finally delivered to the dealer Consolidated Motors, October 14th, 1968. On the invoices for this car, you can see a base price of $3,464.60. Then it lists all the options with prices that are on the car, including a delivery charge, giving a total of $4,420.40. There are three invoices for this car as it went through each division and when it gets to Consolidated Motors, there's an invoice to them for $4,591.40. This car has a suggested retail price on the invoice as well, 
$5,627.90. That's a lot of money for a car in 1969. This is due to the fact that the convertible is an XR7, which is a luxury package, and it has the GT performance and handling package, as well as many other options. So let's get into some of these options. I'll start with the XR7 package and what they were. So all XR7s were made with soft leather front and rear seats, um, high, like the high-end cars, like the Lincolns, rather than the vinyl seats like the standard Cougars. Uh, XR7s have simulated burl walnut on the instrument panel, uh, steering wheel and glove box. The glove box has an XR7 emblem and a large electric clock that's readable from the driver's position. Other luxuries that are standard equipment on an XR7 uh, include door courtesy lights, rocker switch panel, uh, door assist straps, map pockets on the rear of both front seats, rear seat armrests, deep loop carpeting, tachometer with a trip meter, a full set of gauges and warning lights, deluxe wheel covers, chrome belt line moldings, and a left hand controlled racing mirror with a chrome base. While researching this car, we found out that the chrome base was discontinued around the end of the year. So the XR7s built after that would not have a chrome base mirror. So on to the GT package. Uh, in 1969, the GT was not a separate model as it was the two previous years, nor did it include the S Code 390 engine. This is the way it was for all the Ford and Mercury cars in 1969. The GT was just an option, not a separate model. For the Cougar in 1969, the GT Performance Group was also known as the GT Equipment Group or 351 Performance Group. This performance package had an option price of $107. It included a competition handling package that had high rate front and rear springs, larger ball joints, large diameter stabilizer bar, wider wheels. The GT package also came with dual exhaust and dual hood stripes with a Cougar insignia on the front of the hood. This hood stripe was very similar to the ones found on the 428 CJ cars, but did not say 428 in the center. This option also included the 290 horsepower 351 Windsor four barrel engine. This was the first year for the 351 Windsor and the only year for the four barrel. This particular engine in this car is very unique in a piece of history. This engine really adds to what makes this Cougar special. It's one of my favorite things about the car, but we'll get into that a little bit later. So getting back to the options, listed as an option on the Marty Report is a white power top with glass window. This isn't on the invoice because there was no charge being a convertible, but it's on the Marty because there was color options. Uh, other options include automatic transmission, which is an FMX, and it was $240. Uh, F70 14 wide oval white wall tires were $111. Power windows and door locks, $129. Sport console, $67. Power steering, $114. The AM 8-track radio was a $237 option, more than double the price of the GT option. Headrests were an option of $18. Deluxe seat belts, $18. A heavy-duty battery was $9.60. And the power front disc brakes and tilt and tilt away steering wheel show as a package price of $152.90 on the invoice, although they are listed separate on the Marty report. This car also has the very rare power ventilation option, or sometimes called comfort, vent comfort stream ventilation. It had a price tag of $47.20, and as I mentioned earlier, $107 for the GT option. So before I get into the story of this engine, I'm going to talk about how we ended up with the car, uh, some of the work we did on the car, uh, the research that was involved with it, and I'm going to try to keep this sh short even though there's lots to talk about. So in 2015, my dad phoned me and said a friend of his had told him about a Cougar convertible that a local farmer had sitting in a shed. He wondered if he should go look at it and wanted to know if I was still interested in him. Cougars in our area have been uh, known to be very rusty. We worried about that one with this one being a convertible. Uh, but decided we should probably go take a look, so we both prefer the 69s. My dad phoned me later and said, you know, the car looks really good, and he thinks it's serial number 16. He wanted to go back and have a better look at it and confirm that the number really is 500016 as opposed to 600016. He emailed me the next uh, evening uh, with pictures of the car and telling me the good news, and he bought the Cougar. And as we do for all our Ford and Mercury cars, my dad said him wait for the Marty report. He also contacted the Cougar Club of America to maybe find out a little more about the car and received an email back from Phil Parcells. Phil told him that the car was built on the first day of production and that the date code on this car isn't the actual date of production, but a code used by Ford and most likely an introductory show car. He also commented, commented that it was a wonderful find if we decided to restore this car to please resist the temptation to modify it 
and went on to say that its value lies in its low serial number and its many oddities that the car has. Mom and Dad spent countless hours cleaning the car. It was very dirty from sitting in that building since 1984. After the car was cleaned and we recorded some of the Cougar's numbers, we put the car away in our storage building. At that time, we wondered if the Cougar could be the car from the commercials or the ads, maybe the first convertible. As it turns out, it wasn't the commercial car or from any ads, nor was it the first convertible, but it was one of the first convertibles and also one of the first 351 Windsors, being the first year for the convertible and the first year for the Windsor in an early serial number car. When we received the Marty report, it was confirmed that this Cougar was one of the first day production introductory show cars. So in the spring of 2016, we pulled the Cougar into the shop, checked a few things over and fired up the engine. This was good news, but we only ran the engine for a few seconds. We knew the engine was going to be okay, as my dad and I have a lot of experience doing restorations and builds over the years. My dad has been restoring Ford and Mercury vehicles for over 50 years, and I've been working on them for 35 years now. We then went through the car recording more casting numbers, date codes, put the car away into storage again before I returned home. In the winter 2016-17, my dad pulled the engine and transmission out of the car and started to work on the mechanical repairs. A complete brake job, including the lines, hoses, proportioning valve, calipers, etc. Uh, everything was replaced or rebuilt and kept original numbers whenever it was possible. Uh, my dad also did some suspension work and, record, and, sorry, and worked on the fuel system. Uh, new tank, lines, pump, etc. And just a lot more cleaning, painting, recording numbers, uh, documenting the work that he was doing. Well, about midway through the winter, uh, I made a deal to purchase the car for my father. Uh, I was excited to get this car and started digging deeper into the introductory show cars and how special this one was. I own other Mercury cars and trucks too, so to add this piece of Mercury history to my collection was great. Before my wife and I picked the car up, my dad cleaned up the engine, replaced some gaskets and valve stem seals, cleaned up the cooling system, reinstalled the engine, and got it running good enough to drive onto our trailer. When I got the car home, I rebuilt the carburetor, made some repairs to the distributor, cleaned the points, installed plugs, wires, set the timing, etc. Uh, I also set the valves and a few other things to get the car running good enough to get it to the exhaust shop. I wanted to drive it around and see what other problems were going to arise from the car from sitting so long so we could repair them. I did have a transmission leak on the pan gasket, so we changed that with a gasket and filter using Wix products. And of course the power steering leaked. Uh, so I replaced all five hoses with a reproduction kit and I rebuilt the power steering valve and the cylinder with kits from Gates. I did that rather than replacing them because there's actually uh, July 1968 date codes on those parts. So during the winter of 2017-18, I continued to work on the car. Uh, I repaired a coolant leak on the intake manifold, changed out the inner and outer tie rod ends and adjusting sleeves with Moog products. Uh, I got the power convertible top working, repaired switches and wiring for the power windows. I uh, got the headlights working and just cleaned up some of the electrical on the car in general. Uh, I put white wall tires back on the car with XR7 hubcaps and the proper 14 inch rims to fit over the front disc brake calipers. I also diagnosed and repaired the signal lights. The first repair was in the column as I was missing one of my power wires to the module located in the trunk. There's one of the six lights not working correctly as of now because of an issue in the electronic module itself, but I do plan on replacing that soon. So right now we're just working on a little bit of the body issues. The way the car was stored for all those years, one side was up against the wall so it was protected, but the other side was exposed. It must have things dragged down it and bumped into it. So I'm addressing some of these issues on the car. Uh, that's what I'm currently working on. I should also mention too that the farmer uh, did have this car repainted in the early 80s as he was going to restore this car for his wife. So the car has been repainted, the top has been changed, and there's new carpet installed over some sheet metal repairs in the floor. I assume that this car probably sat outside at one point in its life rotting the top out and that's why these repairs were needed. While I've been working on the car and recording numbers, I did find that the right front fender on this car has been changed. The rest of the sheet metal and those small repairs is all original sheet metal with 68 day codes. The one fender that has been changed has a January 69 day code and I believe it was probably changed around the spring of 69. Like I had mentioned before, my dad was emailing back and forth with Phil Parcells after he had bought the car. Some of the other people that we talked to were Terry Frisch from the CCOA, Don Rush from West Coast Classic Cougars, and Kevin Marty of Marty Auto Works. Uh, we actually have a friend here in Saskatchewan who's friends with Kevin. So on our behalf, when he was in Arizona, he asked Kevin a little more about our car and just first day production cars in general. 
we learned so much the past few years in doing the research on this car. It's been one of my favorite parts about owning the car. You know, this knowledge that I've learned. That and getting the car on the road and sharing its story with people. Uh, once this car was in a CCOA publication and on social media, uh, people actually started to contact me. Uh, sometimes it was just to chat about the car and others that are actually able to help me with the Cougars research. Uh, one gentleman uh, helped me out by giving me the part number I needed to replace the points in this unique distributor. And it's getting hard to find that stuff up here. Uh, I have to thank uh, Crystal and Kurt Lawrence from KTL Restorations for reaching out to me. They've been a huge help in figuring out some of the odd parts on the car and helping with some of the timeline. They're super friendly, intelligent individuals there that just do top-notch work. Uh, there's a reason these guys are called the Cougar Specialists. also want to thank the CCOA and uh, Cameron Wahid for contacting me about doing a story on my car for the 50th anniversary edition. Uh, very grateful that they chose my Cougar as one of the cars for the magazine. This was actually the second time the Cougar had been in the publication and we knew a lot about the a lot more about the car at that time so it was kind of like an update article and uh, as well we we know more about the car now. Uh, I also talked to other owners and collectors of low production, low serial number uh, Cougars and collectors and researchers of 04G cars. Um, one guy from Texas, Texas has become uh, an authority, I guess you could say, on these 04G cars and collects them. Uh, he was even flown out to Kale Yarbrough's uh, ranch to authenticate one of his cyclones. Uh, the people I've met uh, through the research on this car is from one heck of an experience, like Warren Shetler. He is, uh, I believe it's called the Canadian Drag Racing Hall of Fame is what he's in. He's from Winnipeg and raced for Ford and Mercury through the 60s. He even helped diagnose some 427 engine, engine issues for NASCAR in I think a 69 season. Uh, there's articles and you can read about him on online. He also put a 427 single overhead cam in one of the original GT40 cars and he was a friend of the late Carroll Shelby's. When he told him about the GT40, Carroll had to come and see it as they discussed doing this before Ken passed. So Carroll had a press conference or something in Vancouver, so he flew from there to Winnipeg to see the car and take it out for a spin. That's a pretty cool story. So Warren also worked at Wiley Motors in Winnipeg, which was the other Mercury dealership there. My car came from Consolidated Motors, from their competition, I guess. Uh, although he doesn't know my car, he does know about the muscle parts program, the performance parts that were put into the engines, how they modified them, as he was directly involved with this through the Ford Performance Division. When I talked with him, and we went through a bunch of the numbers on the parts and invoices, try to figure out what was done and when, he, along with myself and other people that have helped me uh, through with this engine, have come up with kind of like a, a most likely scenario when, when this was done. Um, so let's get into this engine. So the 351 Windsor in this Cougar is the original engine to the car. The VIN is stamped in the block. Uh, date codes are right on the heads. It's a 10.7 to 1 M code four barrel that produced 300 or sorry 290 horsepower and 385 foot pounds of torque. Uh, the performance stuff that is done to this engine takes it north of the 350 range. Um, all the parts are from the Ford and Shelby, and they have 69 part numbers, casting numbers. So in January of 69, Ford launched a program called the Muscle Parts Program. They released a catalog with these performance packages that you could buy and were available in different stages or levels of horsepower gain. They had cool names like Compressor, Controller, Dominator. This was for the 69 engines. And they also came out with a revised catalog for the 70 engines, such as the Cleveland. So very similar to what they do today and what other companies do today. In 1969 catalog, they have two 351 Windsor packages available in various stages. It's these parts that are on this Cougar's engine, but it's a little more than just parts out of the catalog. Excuse me. I also have an article from Ford of Canada in their racing news section titled, Mike Woods Makes It Fly. Now this article describes this engine almost to a T. A quick little background on who he was. Um, Mike Woods was the captain of the Canadian drag race team of, that was piloted by John Phillips and Wally Parks in 1970. This Ford Performance Clinic traveled around the country promoting these performance parts and safe racing. He was also partners in a Ford dealership called Wood Larkin located in southern Ontario and one is, was one of the three guys that received a 271 horse Hypo 289 Falcon in 1969 by Ford to go racing with. These were not cars that you could buy from Ford. This engine was not available in the Falcon. 
Uh, so these three BFX cars went on to be quite famous in the NHRA circuit, especially in Canada. Mike Wood's car was named the Gold Digger, Don Haver's car, Mr. 289, and the famous Rankin Ford Wild Child Falcon that eventually swapped out the 289 for a 427 and then later the 427 single overhead cam engine. Uh, Mike Woods and these guys were so good at modifying these 289s, they were running quarter miles, ETs in like the mid to high 11s. So this is the Mike Woods who worked with Ford, uh, worked in their Ford Performance Division is the guy who wrote this article on how to make the 351 Windsor fly. He states in the article that the 351 Windsor is basically a 289, so a lot about what they knew about 289 performance can be applied to these 351s. As he describes it, it's almost exactly how the engine was built in this Cougar, with only one minor difference. Now I'm not saying this engine has a direct link to Mike Woods, we don't know that. Unfortunately, many of these guys have passed on, and finding out exactly why this engine performance package was installed in an introductory show car might remain a mystery. So like I said before, <clears throat> I've had a lot of help from people researching exactly what we have. Uh, we haven't located an invoice for this engine work, which apparently isn't odd because sometimes stuff like this was done behind the scenes or hush hush. Uh, so with the assistance from certain individuals, going through part numbers, dates, uh, numbers on the Marty and the invoices, we strongly believe the engine was modified from new, but after it left the factory and arrived in Canada. And the car was sold in the beginning of February, and we believe that's when the car went into the shop to have this engine work done. Now, this could have been done by uh, one of the Ford executives or managers of the dealership, someone involved with the Ford Performance Division, or even someone with just lots of money. Uh, just the parts alone would have cost more than $1,000 in 1969. And this price doesn't include the labor costs, the work involved in modifying the engine or the r, &R. Even the car itself was very expensive. So all said and done, it would have been an extremely expensive project that would have avoided any warranty that the car would have came with. That's why I still believe there is some kind of connection with Ford and Mercury's performance division. Maybe they were testing these parts on this car. It could even explain the early fender replacement. Maybe they bumped a wall at the local track testing it. Of course, this is just one of many theories. So here's what's done to the engine. The heads were removed and machined to accept pushrod guide plates and screw in rocker studs. A new hydraulic camshaft was installed along with hardened pushrods, upgraded valve springs, and pre-65 2D9 high post style rocker arms. Warren Shuttler told me uh, there was more action on those rockers for the high lift cam and that's why this was done. So here's a list of the parts and the numbers that are on this engine. So it's a 1969 351 Windsor 4 barrel C9OE-B casting with 9F500016 stamped in the block which matches the VIN. The heads are a C9OE-B with a date code of July 29th and July 30th 1968. They have been machined for pushrod guide plates and screw in rocker studs. The part number on the guide plates is C9OX-B and the rocker arms are 289 non-rail type that were available under part number C9OZ-C. The springs have been upgraded with one-piece design retainers, C9OZD, and hardened keepers, C9ZZA. The camshaft has been swapped out to what we believe is the 290-degree C9OZC, as this was the camshaft used for this upgrade package, and the firing order has been changed to the order that is needed for this camshaft. An aluminum high-rise intake was installed with the casting number C9OXA, or part number C9OZE, uh, CF. 600 CFM 4150 Holly carburetor, part number C90F-R, and a chrome air cleaner that was used on both the 2D9 Hypo and the 66390GT uh, was also installed. Uh, it's number C5ZZW. I have a reproduction air cleaner on the engine now, as the original one was in poor condition. Another upgrade that was part of this package was changing the relief valve and spring assembly in the oil pump, but without removing it and comparing it to a stock one, we can only assume that this was done as well. The distributor is a 1969 Shelby Mallory Dual Point, part number 351A-A, and was available in the Shelby Performance Catalog under part number 8154. It also has the matching Voltmaster coil by Mallory. The plug wires were a Boss 302 type C9OZA and have and it will be replaced with a reproduction set. Uh, the spark plugs were BF32s, but I have changed them to a Champion RF9YC. Uh, 
It was a very professional looking plate riveted to this rad support on this car with the new firing order and tune-up specs for all these performance changes. Uh, we've been told by members of the CCOA, KTL, other res restoration experts to make sure we leave that place in place eh? uh, as part of this Cougar's unique history. This car also had uh, long tube headers on it when we got it, uh, but they were rotted and unusable from sitting against a dirt floor for so many years. You could poke your finger right through them. One collector was completely gone. By comparing various pictures of these headers, we believe that they were hooker headers. In Mike Wood's performance article, he also states to use hooker long tube headers. And in Ford Muscle Parts book, under the headers and distributor, it says use a non-Ford part. Although we could have replaced the headers with a similar design from hooker, we chose to use stock 69 exhaust manifolds for the time being. There is also a steering drop bracket on this Cougar to allow room for the headers, which I left on, so the headers can be installed later on. There is also Kel custom valve covers with two vent caps and a downdraft tube, but I have installed a PCV system. Air shocks and Lakewood traction bars were also on the car when we bought it, but we have since replaced the shocks to give it more stock stance and removed the traction bars, but still have them put aside. What I think is really cool, over all the years of owning this car and doing the research, we've never found another complete muscle parts package or an example of all these parts together on a 351 Windsor. And we're running them just like they did in 1969, and the car runs really strong. Uh, there may have been other Windsors built like this, uh, but as of now, well, we have the only one known to exist. I mean, it's just neat to have this uh, muscle parts book and this Canada Ford performance article in your hands while you're looking at the engine that's described in these publications. And it's also neat to have something like this on a, on a unique performance package uh, put on such a rare uh, production, low serial number introductory car. Uh, the car as a whole is a remarkable piece of history and something that should be saved. Uh, it was a great learning experience, furthering my knowledge, a lot of fun doing the research on this Cougar. Uh, people I've met along the way, friendships that have come from researching this car is something really special to me. Uh, getting the story out there about the car, getting it cleaned up and back on the road, I mean, it's been great. So to recap, this low serial number 00016XR7 Cougar being a factory built pre-production introductory convertible show car makes this car rare. This XR7 convertible having a GT package and a low production number makes this car rare. The muscle parts performance package on this car makes it rare. This really is a one-of-a-kind, very rare piece of Mercury, Cougar history, and Ford performance history all in one. It's a true numbers matching car with original powertrain, has 90% of its factory sheet metal, as well as many original numbers matching parts throughout the whole car. It's the only one like it in the world.